about a third of us went to school, undergraduate high school in, in, in the United States. Anyway, so about the 11th grade, we, we studied something called English literature, okay? And uh, they always have you studying somebody uh, by the name of Samuel Johnson and James Boswell, okay? Um, and these were two of the great literary figures in the English world, and these were both Brits, Englishmen. And uh, anyway, um, the two were kind of like a Batman and Robin combination and uh, became very famous. Well, what happened is this. James Boswell was often talking about a special day in his life. And what happened on that day that made it special was his father took him fishing. And he mentioned it so often, and he talked about all the things that he learned on that fishing trip, that eventually somebody thought, hey, you know what? It'd be interesting to not only hear about what uh, James thinks, but let's go and take a look at his father's journal. Because back in those days, you know, everybody kept their own little private Facebook. They called it a journal. Okay, and so they looked in the father's journal, and this is what they found that he had written. Turning to that date, the reader found only one sentence entered. Quote, gone fishing today with my son, semicolon, a day wasted, period. Okay, now, Good thing James never saw that. But you see the entirely different perspectives on the thing. And yet, because of that day and the lessons that James learned, these things became ingrained in him because he would speak of them to his friends in other settings, and they were the little bits and pieces of his learning that would mark his life and make him the great man that he turned out to be. Now, the part that I wrote was, I mean read, was from a book called The Effective Father, written by Gordon MacDonald. And uh, this is from the chapter called No Day is Ever Wasted. And I chose that as a title for today's topic, okay? Because it was a title that I had heard when I was studying more intensely about devotions, spiritual disciplines. After I came back from seminary and I was uh, wanting to improve my spiritual life and thinking, what kind of programs should we teach to the people to help them to really grow? I got very much into the spiritual disciplines movement. And I still remember running across the phrase, wasting time with God. And I says, what? <laughs> and basically the idea is, you know, when you're good friends with somebody, right? You got a good buddy. Sometimes you get together. And do you have a purpose necessarily in mind? Do you have something you really try to achieve? No, you just like to hang around together. You just like to be together. You basically end up wasting time together. And so this author was trying to impress on us the concept, because especially Americans, right? Every moment has got to be marked down. When I was practicing law, we had to account for every 10 minutes of the hour so that we can bill properly. And I imagine that some executives, they're even more detailed in how they mark their time. And so we feel like we've got to be doing something. We've got to be moving forward. And he's saying, no. Sometimes, you know, you just sit in silence before him. Sometimes you're just praying and just talking about how much you love him instead of praying to accomplish something to gain something, to be relieved from something, and just trying to be productive. And so that concept and that wording struck me, and I thought, you know, 
Today, we're talking about the second type of language of love that we're using to focus the many ways that we experience and share love. And that is, what topic based on the illustration from Boswell's life? What would you call it? What would be the gift? What would be the language of love that we're talking about? Anybody want to venture? No? Quality time. Okay? Giving quality time to someone. Um, we're not only going to cover that. We actually have to go back because we've had some interruption from Easter, and I think March has been a kind of a crazy month. There's been a lot of in and out. So we're actually going to go back and we're going to talk about love because the Bible says love is supreme. We're going to talk about what it means. Then we're going to go back and talk about the first language. Anybody remember what the first language was? Words of affirmation. Now, I know you know it. You just don't have my wording for it, right? But when you say good things to people and you affirm them, okay? Let me give you the other three. And I want you, after I give them to you, to think on two levels. Number one, which one of these is most natural to me? Okay? And then, second, that is, when I say, what is most natural? What's the language you're most likely to use? The second one is, what's the one I need the most? Because they're not necessarily the same thing. You could be a person who's just great at words of affirmation, but the thing you need are not words of affirmation. Your sense of esteem is very, very high, but what you want is quality time. You see? So those are the two levels. All right, so we have words of affirmation. We have quality time. Third one are gifts. And if you want, feel free to pull out a pencil and write these things down, okay? So words of affirmation, quality time, gifts. Next one is service, okay? And then finally, the fifth one is physical contact. And, and, and I'm so surprised because, you know, they're not always what you would expect. I'm thinking about one of my relatives. And I think, you know, he was a kind of a guy who got, who, who really needed physical contact. And I think instead what he got was a lot of service. Okay? And it just didn't quite do it for him. And he's expressed that. So anyway, uh, so, so it's worth thinking about. It's not just like, okay, I know exactly what I am good at or what I need. So take a moment, and for yourself, what do you think it is? Do, do I need to repeat the five because you didn't write it down? Okay, all right. <laughs> Words of affirmation, all right. Quality time, service, and you don't have to put them in these order, all right. Gifts and physical contact. And, and I told you that, you know, this was from um, Gary Chapman, and, you know, this has touched so many people that he's put out specialized versions of this, basically the same book, all right? He's addressed it to men. He's addressed it to servicemen, military. He has addressed it for teens. He has addressed it for uh, children. Um, I think there's one more. But so so it's, it's relevant to all populations on all levels. Okay? So anyway, uh, we're not going to ask anybody to share what you decided about yourself. But I want you to keep this in mind so that as we're going through the five, you know, you're going to say, yeah, is this true about me? Or do I need to adjust it? Okay? So uh, anyway, let's go back to the idea that love is of supreme importance according to God. Um, we've said it 
in various ways and how it is the thing that endures over faith, hope, faith and hope, that it never fails, that love is what God is, and our calling is to imitate God. But I want you to hear another expression of it. And this came when the Apostle Paul heard that there are a bunch of new Christians who were getting pressure. They were getting pressure from the Jews who had come to the Lord. And these Jews were saying to these Gentiles, look, in order for you to be a good Christian, what you've got to do is you've got to practice all the Jewish ceremonies and practices in addition, and maybe even before you come to doing the things that Jesus talked about. And uh, so uh, this is what Paul wrote to them in Galatians chapter 5. He says, The whole law, the Old Testament, is fulfilled in one word. Not literally, because he gives them seven words, okay? But he says, in one word, and this is the word, love. And the seven words are, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5.14. And you know, we often look at this verse And we don't give it enough of a thought. But to think that all the laws of the Old Testament were all about love, a little surprising, right? You would think they were ritual. You would think they were about holiness. They would think about them as obligations or God was just making life complicated. But here it says the whole thing is to show love, to show it in tangible ways. And so... Love is to be expressed in tangible form. You know, we have an American expression. You may have used it. I know it's one of Uncle Michael's favorite expressions. He says, show us some love. Show me some love. Wants to see something real, something tangible, something demonstrated. And that's the kind of love that the Bible is really talking about. Because back in the days of the Greeks, they saw love on a very, very idealistic level. Okay? They loved the virtue. They loved it among all the other high virtues. But here's the problem when you are too idealistic about the concept of love. Uh, Cameron, are we ready to show that little cartoon? This is a very famous cartoon. Okay, it's a Bad copy, but can you make it out? What does it say? Well, I love mankind and people are good. Yeah. Okay, I love mankind. I'm such a humanitarian. I'm just full of love. But man, I can't be around you. <laughs> well, that's not the kind of love we're talking about. We're talking about tangible things. It's the kind of down-to-earth, practical love that cooks your favorite food, tucks you in a bed with night, at night with a story and a kiss. You know, this is the kind of love that we're aiming for. And uh, so what happened is when the Christians started to talk about love, they said, all right, so how do we differentiate? How are we going to impress this on everybody so that it's not the same old, same old Linus, Peanuts cartoon type of love that the Greeks had? And so they took a word that wasn't much used by the Greeks but was already in existence. They took the word agape and started to use it. Because Jesus said, I have come to give you a new commandment. And what he was doing was he was taking it to the next level. Beyond the practicality of the Old Testament, where all the laws are summed up in loving your neighbor, he's saying, I'm going to add another layer. And this is the hard layer. And the most dramatic expression of it is we are to love not only our neighbors, not only those who are in need, but who's the most extreme person we are called to love? Our enemies. And you know, it's our natural instinct to rebel against that kind of love. But he used it as a way of calling for an unconditional level of love. 
that is not based on favors. It's not based on their need, you know. In fact, it's the opposite. It is a love that comes out of the pureness and the greatness of our own hearts. And so they needed to explain that, and so they came up with this word. I had all this stuff from the Greek dictionary, but I'm going to skip it. Um, but basically, you know, it was leading them to the next and higher level so that we can love the way God loves. And this was something very new, very important. Now, the Greeks made a mistake, but we Americans make a very different kind of a mistake when we talk about love, okay? Um, since medieval times, there has been a fixation on passionate feelings. Passionate feeling. Now, I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying there's been a fixation on it. And we call it what kind of love? Romantic love. Okay? And think about it. Most cultures for thousands of years was marriage based on romantic love? No way, Jose, right? What happened? People got married based on the practical planning of their parents. Is this going to help our family to survive and perhaps prosper? That was a main driving question. Not, oh, I'm going to fall in love with somebody and we're going to live happily ever after forever. And so, Instead of talking about falling in love, the New Testament concept is more growing in love. Because as we said in previous sermons, the love of God has already been placed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. One of my roses just died. After years of trying to grow my roses, and one of them that was one of my favorites, my gardener pruned it somehow a little too harshly. And I kept waiting all last year for something to sprout, and it didn't sprout. And this year I look at this one stem, and instead of it being green, it's brown. So I thought, oh, well, it's gone, you know. There was one of my best roses, and now it's dead. I was trying to get it to grow and grow and grow. When I bought it from Costco, you know, it had vitality. First few years, it was my best one. Like the rose, our love needs to grow, needs to be nurtured, needs to be protected, needs to be helped along. And so instead of thinking about romantic falling in love, and they've studied it more, we need to think about growing in love. Here are the characteristics of romantic love, all right? Cultural anthropologists have been studying this concept more now that they have isolated it as an interesting phenomenon for study. Here are some of the conclusions. Romantic love is an ecstatic feeling. Remember that? Yeah, you know, you, you are going crazy with love, basically. Second, romantic love is often one-sided. I remember in junior high, several girls that I felt romantic love toward. Did, she, did they love me back? No. <laughs> you know, so it's one-sided. Third, romantic love is a fantasy trip. A prefabricated emotion projected onto others. Wow, that doesn't sound too good. Fourth, romance is being in love with love. And I remember coming to that conclusion when I got out of junior high into high school. And I looked back on those feelings and I said, you know what? I was just in love with being in love. I was so thrilled to have that experience, you know? Uh, and then finally, 
And this is the real reality check. Romantic love is temporary, lasting 18 months to three years. Average about two. And, you know, they've done studies because when you get into that state, your brain produces an excess of chemicals like dopamine. And that drives them. But your body can't sustain on that kind of chemical invasion. All right? Otherwise, you'll have a heart attack. So eventually, it settles down and it cuts back. And that's what happens with romantic love. Dr. Helen Fisher, great anthropologist of love, has done brain scans, and she's charted this thing, and she can tell you exactly the amount of chemicals that happens. But it explains why, you know, after the average honeymoon, you've got about a two-year window, right? Where you're just so in love with any, uh, your partner that they can't do anything wrong. Then suddenly, after two years, Dr. Jekyll becomes Mr. Hyde. You know, and all the things that you thought were so cute start to irritate you. And that's why you need to learn to grow in love. And that it's got to be something that comes from here rather than a reaction to something that's out there. And so this is about growing in that love rather than falling in love or having that idealistic thing. And, you know, think about it. Some of us, our parents, though the marriages were arranged, after years of endeavoring together, after years of hardship, after years of raising children, after years of amazing exploits, you found that at the end, one day, you see mom and dad holding hands very gingerly, you know, just barely the fingertips, and you realize they like each other, you know, and they have grown into love. You know, you can let it happen if you are willing and if you do the right thing. And so that's what we're trying to do with this series, to learn to appreciate the supremacy of love and to grow in it. And the best place, as I said several weeks ago, the place where we have as our safe lab for learning it, is where? Not Las Vegas. Okay? Here. In the church. I still remember the day I ran across this and it hit me for the first time. It's 1 Timothy 1.5. Okay? Um, and, and I was reading at that time the New American Standard and it said this, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. Now, the ESV is even stronger because it doesn't use the word instruction. It uses the word charge. You know what a charge is? A charge is what they give to the pastor as they're ordaining him. You know, this is your instruction, your marching orders, your challenge before you. And so what it's saying is, Paul speaking to Timothy, instructing him about the churches, all of this stuff that we're doing here is to teach us to grow in love from a pure heart. And I thought, oh, all this time, I thought the goal of all this instruction was to know more about the Bible. Well, it is, but there is a real, necessary, practical outcome of making us more like Jesus. All right, so having covered that, I'd like to just quickly talk about words of affirmation. Back in 1982, a little 112-page book, management book came out. I don't know if you remember this title. Raise your hand. The One Minute Manager. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's the kind of book. Uh, thank you, Michael. It's the kind of book I like, all right? 112 pages. And it was small. I mean, it wasn't just 
112 pages, but it was small. And it basically said the same thing over and over. And it basically says, you know what? If you want to succeed as a manager, affirm the people who work for you. Come up to him, look him in the eye, maybe put an arm around him and say, you know, I really like how you wrote that report. So concise and yet so clear. Was that a minute? That was less, less than a minute. But you know, it sounds better if you say the one minute manager than the 37 second manager or something like that. <laughs> so anyway, this book went through the roof. 13 million copies translated into 37 languages. Okay? He started a whole franchise on it, all right? Uh, several more spin-off books. Uh, Ken Blanchard, he's a Christian guy, and, and these are really useful books, okay? But they found that if you would just do that, in fact, in industrial psychology, you know what they found? If the boss would just get out of his office and walk around on the production floor, the work quality and productivity went up. Okay? So just that kind of attention. The Bible affirms the use of verbal affirmation. God says to Jesus, hey, he knows I love him. I don't have to say anything. Is that what God said? No. God says, you are my what? Beloved son. I'm well pleased with you. And how many people would love to hear that from those who are above them? And so, uh, here I'm going to take just a little bit of time to read to you from the Song of Solomon, Canticles, chapter 4. Here's a guy who knows how to use verbal affirmation. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Now, I know we're not too, too, uh, too enamored with the idea of doves and goats, all right? You'd have to use better American expressions than doves and goats. But he goes on like this, and he goes on, and by the time he's finished, he's covered her teeth, he's covered the neck, he's covered uh, her eyes, he even mentions her temple. When was the last time you praised somebody for their temple? Okay, but he covers all of this stuff, and like we said, you know, this is like oxygen. I mean, sometimes you hear something from somebody and you could live a month on it, right? I've had those experiences. There's certain times, certain of those experiences where, boy, every once in a while, I'll go back and I remember it. And it makes me feel good. So anyway, uh, those are verbal affirmation. It's universal. 37 languages can't be wrong. And so... Let's move on to quality time. Jesus and quality time. And Jesus understood the value of quality time. Well, that's kind of a weird statement, huh? Jesus understands the value of all five languages and even more. <laughs> but but we, we see him very much focused in on quality time. When he chose his disciples in Mark 3.14, what does it say? It says, he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles, and here's the conclusion of the sentence. This is the highlight, all right? So that they might be with him. So that they might be with him. And that was so different from the way the Greeks and the rabbis did their discipleship. Well, it was just about instruction and debate. He took these guys, and think about the variety of things that Jesus did with his apostles that did not explicitly involve teaching. 
They enjoy riding on boats together, right? They enjoyed eating together, right? They went fishing together, right? Uh, they did all these things. They were always hiking, <laughs> right? Always taking these long walks together, always going on these road trips. Guys, right? Road trips. The best way to find out who your friends are <laughs> and who your enemies are. <laughs> anyway, and so always doing this kind of stuff with them. Doing it because he knew. He knew something very important. That values are more effectively caught than taught. You pick up values at home before language ever takes place. From watching the way your parents behave. And they are formed and they are shaped before they have a vocabulary of a hundred. And so he takes these guys so that they could be with him and they see what he's doing and how he is when he's doing it. And that way he's molding them without being explicit, being heavy-handed. You know, he only had three years. But Jesus wasted time with these 12. God wasted time with man. The efficient way is to send a legion of angels, right? I mean, if you had an angel walking next to you every day, would you want to be a good Christian right away? Yeah. But he had these 12 with him for these three years wasting time. And I remember in the 70s when discipling in the church was a hot topic and we suddenly realized at the end that, you know what? We weren't really discipling. One guy was sharing a notebook with another guy. You know, we just giving them a notebook. Uh, we were not taking them along with us and there wasn't that process of love that was going on. And so uh, that wasn't effective. Jesus says in John 13, by this will all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Well, guess what? For the longest time, they didn't love each other, that 12. Right? Bickering, fighting, jockeying, elbowing, more like a roller derby team. But finally, they got it. And they started to love one another because they had seen how he had loved them. And so, Jesus did this. One of the, my favorite scenes from the scripture is one time after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And those guys were ready to quit. They were saying, hey, you know, our leader's gone. We've proven ourselves unworthy. We fled like sheep, scared rabbits. What are we going to do next? And so they decided to go fishing. And they were, I think, just that close to giving up and going back. And lo and behold, who did they find on the shore waiting for them? Jesus. And what was he doing? and he was cooking it and he was preparing something for them to eat when they came home Cantonese call that siu yeah okay midnight snack it revived them because what the time and the love to just eat together. This is what moms do. You know, I call it the hidden investment of love. All that background time to prepare that meal. Well, Jesus didn't just do it for the high and mighty, the apostles. He did it for everyone. To the woman at the well who should have been an enemy and he was tired. You know, pastors hate it when they get a call with an emergency at 11 o'clock on Saturday night. 
We're tired and anticipating the next day. So I can identify with Jesus when this Samaritan woman with her little jug of water came walking up to the well. And he had to decide, am I going to talk to her? Well, by talking to her, that whole village became saved. And this woman was taken out of her own pit. Okay? Um, Zacchaeus tells this little guy, hey, I'm going to spend the night with you. Slow down his progress, but I'm going to spend the night with you. Uh, To Matthew, he not only hung around with Matthew, but he hung around with Matthew's outcast friends. And then the worst thing is he even gave time to little children. Simon and Garfunkel would say, a man ain't got no cat class. Children. You see? And so he's doing all this. In fact, he spent so much time with other people in their homes, eating and drinking, that he was accused of being what? A party animal. You ever think about that? Jesus is a party animal. And yet that's what they finally accused him of. And he didn't just do it himself. He encouraged and protected other people when they did. Famous story of two sisters, right? Who was in the kitchen? Martha. And was she getting upset? Yeah. She was banging the pots and she was slamming the cupboard doors, right? I mean, what a commotion. And what was Mary doing? (laughs) Sitting there, just wasting time with Jesus. And Jesus protected that. He says, okay, quit your cooking, Martha, and come on and join us. The real party is out here, not in there. And so that's what he did. So he protects it even for others. Jesus knew about quality time. Okay, well, you know, talk about what it is in essence. In essence, I would say, you think about several things. Number one is taking or making the opportunities to be together. All right? Sometimes you have to grab it when it's coming along. Sometimes you have to make it. I think moms, when they take their kids to school, they do a great job of that. Because when I drive kids to school, I'm watching out for traffic, defensive driving. Okay? I want to get there fast. That's men. But the women, what are they doing? They're chatting up a storm. They're turning that into a real opportunity. Okay? So that's the first thing, is to take or make opportunity. Second, it's about the experience. It calls for involvement and attentiveness. You're looking to make some memory together. Sitting there, talking to each other, actually to each other, not texting somebody far away or checking out the sports scores, okay? Listen, you ever talking to me and you hear my phone ring? Ignore it. You know why? Because that's what I'm doing. Because you are more important than that phone call, which is interrupting the two of us right now. See? So it's just really trying to make that into a sense of involvement and attentiveness and uh, making memories together. Uh, One of the things Pat and I like to do is we like to take cooking classes together, okay? Uh, One of our classes is when we were in Denver and they had an all-star Vietnamese chef and we learned how to cook Vietnamese together. And we have wonderful memories from that experience. Good food, too, but wonderful memory from that experience. Third thing you want to do is learn to talk and open up. We talk about God's revelation being general revelation, nature, creation, but their special revelation, which is him speaking to us through the word. See, you can sit there forever with somebody, guy sitting there with the girl, 
they're doing homework, and um, the guy says, hey, what do you think of Bill? And she says, well, Bill's okay. Oh, I thought you liked Bill. No, I don't like Bill as much as I like someone else. He says, oh, who's that? Well, who do you think? <laughs> she had to verbalize it. It had to be spoken. For all their homework together, sitting side by side, he would have never known. And so sometimes we need to say, and that takes us back to words of affirmation, right? And words of expression. Sometimes we need to be explicit and be very clear. And I want to just give you several things you can do when you're together to talk. All right? I want you to write these things down. And if you don't get it, then Google daily temperature reading. And if you really want to get on board, there's an app for it. <laughs> okay? Because they found that this does so much to increase bonding and closeness. Number one, share appreciations. Hey, thanks for the way you cooked those peas last night. My, other, my mother always mashed them, but I like the way you do it much better. Okay, appreciation. Second thing is new information. Hey, what's happening with that project at work? All right? Uh, how is that new supervisor doing? Third, questions and puzzles. What did you mean when you said what you said while I was falling asleep last night? <laughs> you know? Ask, follow up, close the loop. Puzzles and questions. Four, concerns with recommendation. This gets a little more delicate, but you need to get to this. Here's an example. You want me to take the kids as soon as I come home from work. I know you're tired, tired of them, but I'm wound up from my commute. How about we try letting me have 15 minutes to shower and to chill before you hand them over, okay? So you see, and you have worked through a stumbling block, okay? And so you express a concern and then you give a recommendation. And the concern shows your love, all right? Number uh, five, wishes, hopes, and dreams. I'd love it if we can start planting some heirloom tomatoes in the backyard, whatever. So these are the things that you can do, and then we can amp it up some more by learning listening skills. But basically, you know, we've got to get focused attention and emotional connection and especially with the priority people in our lives. Not to manipulate, but again, just so that we can show our love. Uh, if words of affirmation are like oxygen, then time, quality time together, is really like water. I'm going to give you a moment, okay? And think about it. Think of who are the key people in your life that deserves or need more quality time for you. And you know, it doesn't have to be long. It has to be focused so you can connect. Because it's easy to just let it be taken for granted and a year passes and then five years and then 10 years and you wonder why you don't still feel honeymoonish when you could, when you could be growing in love. And then think of some activities that you enjoy doing. You know, we took the kids to do kayaking. Maybe you want to do kayaking with somebody significant. Um, maybe you want to just roast some hot dogs together. Uh, maybe you want to go and check out the farmer's market and find out about each other's respective tastes and share ideas for meals together and people to entertain. You, you see how it could blossom and develop and grow? So it's not that hard. And none of these will be that hard. But they are the five most frequently valued and needed love languages. And that's why instead of me preaching through 57 things from the New Testament about how to love, we're focusing on five. All right? So we've covered the first love language. What was that? 
Yeah, words of affirmation. Your own wording is fine. Second one? Whew, I'm glad you got that second one right. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for the quality time we spend together on Sundays with you. And we just ask that you, the one who would spend 30 years on earth just growing, and then three years on earth getting really close to priority people, that we will learn to be like you. Bless us as we go forward. May we all grow in love day after day, week after week. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.